Our scripture passage this morning is a fairly familiar one. It comes from the ninth chapter of Matthew, a few verses. Listen here and receive God's word. As Jesus was walking along, he saw a man called Matthew sitting at the tax booth. And Jesus said to him, follow me. And Matthew got up and followed him. And as Jesus sat at dinner in the house, many tax collectors and sinners came and were sitting with him and his disciples. When the Pharisees saw this, they said to Jesus' disciples, Why does your teacher eat with tax collectors and sinners? But when Jesus heard this, he said, Those who are well have no need of a physician, but those who are sick. Go and learn what this means. I desire mercy, not sacrifice. For I have come to call not the righteous, but sinners. While Jesus was saying these things to them, suddenly a leader of the synagogue came in and knelt before him, saying, My daughter has just died, but come and lay your hand on her, and she will live. And Jesus got up and followed him with his disciples. Then suddenly a woman who had been suffering from hemorrhages for 12 years came up behind him and touched the fringe of his cloak. For she said to herself, if I only touch his cloak, I will be made well. Jesus turned and seeing her, he said, take heart, daughter, your faith has made you well. And instantly the woman was made well. When Jesus came to the leader's house and saw the flute players and the crowd making a commotion, he said, go away, for the girl is not dead, but sleeping. And they laughed at him. But when the crowd had been put outside, Jesus went in and took the daughter, the young girl, by the hand, and she got up. And the report of this spread throughout that district. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. According to an article that I read on the website um, called Health Agenda, nurturing and loving human touch has a multitude of health benefits. Jim's shaking his head. He's a physical therapist. He knows these things. The article states that both the giver and the receiver of appropriate human touch stimulates the release of a variety of good feeling chemicals in our bodies. It indicates that there are receptors in our skin that communicate directly to our brains. That skin to skin contact for newborn babies is essential for physical and psychological development. That regular hugs are associated with lower blood pressure and heart rates better psychological and physical health, improved relationships, and the ability to handle conflict. I think that many of us can agree that human touch helps us feel connected, socially accepted, and it communicates cooperation and trust. It soothes, relieves pain, and can boost our immune systems. Conversely, we must acknowledge that there are far too many times in the lives of far too many people when human touch is unloving, it's callous, destructive, abusive, harmful, demeaning, and leads to mental, emotional, and physical harm, and yes, even sometimes death. We can't leave that out of the equation. Maya Roberts writes in her novel, The V-Girl, A Coming-of-Age Story, the human touch is that little snippet of physical affection that brings a bit of comfort, support, and kindness. It doesn't take much from the one who gives it, but it can make a huge difference in the one who receives it. End of quote. In the eighth and ninth chapters of the Gospel of Matthew, the writer shares many accounts of Jesus physically, metaphorically, and spiritually touching people. And on some occasions, people acting by faith, boldness, and trust actually reached out by calling aloud or physically touching Jesus. 
In this day, many of us have an aversion to touching. Even those we may love or care about. And to touch a stranger is not socially accepted. It can be offensive and intrusive. And I must admit that post-COVID, that in post-COVID, many of us are still adjusting to touching and being touched by others, especially in public places. So before reaching out and touching anyone, as Diana Ross often sings, it's always best to ask permission. Jesus, in his infinite wisdom and as a healer, prophet, and Messiah, knew that the whole reason he came to earth was to touch and to heal, to extend mercy and grace and to reconcile our human condition back to God. In Matthew, Jesus reaches out and touches people living on the margins, people who are ostracized and considered ritually unclean. Jesus does not fear getting proximate to people who are mentally and physically ill and those whom society and especially the religious of his day shunned, demonized, or ignored. The Torah prescribed that anyone who touched an unclean person would be defiled, and yet Jesus set aside the religious practices and social protocols to get close and to touch the very folks that proper and religious society sent to the outskirts of the city, demanded that they keep their distance or announce their presence in order to be avoided, or required to isolate away from society. Human touch was denied to the very people who needed community support, restoration, and healing the most. And it deprived those who were in a position to render a healing touch the opportunity to be changed as well. Jesus acknowledged that his ministry of grace, reconciliation, and healing was not for those for, who perceived themselves to be well, but for those who were sick and on the outside. So re Jesus reached out and touched the man suffering from leprosy, healed his disease, and then sent him to be pronounced ritually clean by showing himself to the priest. By doing this, Jesus was fulfilling the law of Torah. Jesus touched Peter's mother-in-law, a woman who was not his relative by blood, but who was his spiritual daughter. And her body was healed, and then she got up immediately off of her sick bed and served Jesus. Jesus calls Matthew, the tax collector, to leave his despised and sinful profession. And then Jesus shared a meal with him and others, much to the chagrin of others. How could Jesus sit at table, touch and consume people who were sinners? took financial advantage of others and worked for the Roman government. But after receiving the metaphysical touch from Jesus, Matthew gave up everything. He left his lucrative and despised profession <coughs> and became a follower of Jesus, a disciple. <coughs> Excuse me. Calling Matthew out of his daily despised and exploitive profession and breaking bread with him, Jesus reordered social and communal relationships, the inclusion of the excluded. Even though daughters were not generally prized by Jewish fathers, a man of stature, a synagogue leader, and a girl dad of his day, boldly and respectfully sought out Jesus. This man knew by faith that Jesus could raise his daughter who had just died from the dead. The father implored Jesus to come to his home and touch his daughter. Thank you, Tom. But Jesus was interrupted, Matthew writes, as an audacious and tenacious woman who had hemorrhaged for 12 long years, who by faith believed that if she touched Jesus' garment as he was on his way to the synagogue's leader's house, she would be healed. The Gospel of Mark states that this woman had spent all that she had seeking medical attention, a remedy for her illness, and yet she was worse off. She was financially destitute, alone, and had grown desperate. <laughs> Why would this woman risk her very life to leave her home where she was safe, 
yet ill, to venture out into the community that had shunned and pronounced her ritually unclean in an attempt to reach out and touch the tassel of Jesus' garment, rendering him and everyone else in the crowd as unclean as well. I'm glad you asked. <laughs> that unclean, marginalized, and sick woman's touch pro provided an opportunity for Jesus to share that faith even into the proverbial rope faith, faith that musters up just enough strength to extend a hand and inconspicuously touch the tassel hanging from Jesus' prayer garment. Audacious faith that risk it all results in healing, reconciliation, as well as acknowledgement and restoration. Declaring her faith had healed her, Jesus called this woman daughter. And Jesus restored her back into her community. Now Jesus turns his attention back to the synagogue leader's request. Even though daughters were not generally prized, again, this man was a girl dad. And so he boldly and respectfully sought out Jesus. This man knew by faith that Jesus could raise his daughter from the dead. <coughs> Arriving at the synagogue leader's house, Jesus finds that mourning has already begun. Once again, Jesus dispenses with tradition and religious strictures and risk being marginal marginalized himself for touching the dead. He dismisses the mourners, the musicians, and all the unbelievers. They had to get out of the way. And then Jesus touched the hand of the young girl, and she is restored to life. One commentator writes, along with Jesus, this passage provides us with an unlikely hero and an unforgettable heroine. The synagogue leader who humbles himself and the unwanted woman who had the moxie to grab hold of Jesus' cloak. They come from different places and for different reasons. One is at the top of the social ladder. The other had been left off completely. One had an urgent and dire need, and the other had a chronic and more complicated condition. Both have faith. Both received attention from Jesus, and the miraculous resulted. End of quote. Jesus tells the Pharisees, I desire mercy, not sacrifice. You see, sacrifices can be ritualistic, routine, or replace what is really needed in most situations. Mercy and grace, forgiveness and reconciliation. Jesus' ministry to the outcast does not negate his openness or ministry to the powerful and the privileged. No one is beyond Jesus' mercy. In this passage, Jesus' ministry to heal the physical illnesses of the outcast and to enlighten was to, and to enlighten to heal the hard-heartedness and the judgment of the privileged and the religious. Jesus made it his business to get proximate to people society shunned, marginalized, ostracized, oppressed, and treated unjustly. Touchy matters indeed. Even when doing so, touching, touching can become touchy exposing us to being, to the potential of being classified as going against traditions, setting aside social formalities and conventions and expectations, putting ourselves in the position of being ridiculed, marginalized, or criticized as well. Earlier, Jim and Heather read the passage from Genesis where God called Abram and Sarai to leave their homes, to go to a place that God would point out to them. Now, God didn't physically touch them at that moment, but God's spirit spoke to their spirit. God touched them in a place that created an outpouring of faith and trust and belief and hope that where God would lead them would be a land of plenty a land where they would receive everything that they needed, a land where they would receive the one thing that they had not been able to achieve. 
an heir. Author, activist, artist, and founder of the Living Kindness Foundation, Jan Phillips writes in Divining the Body, of all the gifts we can give to people, the gift of our touch is one of the most priceless. Through our hands, we convey a kind of radiance. A warmth seeps out from inner fire. A wrap for, for someone's chill. A light for another's dark. End of quote. As followers of Christ, we are called to be unconventional. To be the ones willing to step outside of our comfortable homes, lives, positions, and professions and to walk with the least, the lost, and the left behind. We are called to physically, spiritually, or metaphorically touch people who reside on the fringes, who have lost all hope, who are shunned by everyone else. People of God, we are called to wade into touching matters and by faith believe that we will find the Spirit of God has gone before us, meets us there, and by faith believe that just a touch from us will and can change lives, circumstances, conditions, people, us. Beloved, touch matters. The simple act of touching a person changes everything it changes everything so go out and touch the life the lives of those who need it the most may it be so amen <laughs>